SpaceX is racing towards Starship Flight 11, but Ship 38 hasn't had an easy road. Multiple static fire attempts ran into unexpected issues, forcing aborts and intense troubleshooting. Stick around as we break down exactly what happened. The centerpiece of this flight is Ship 38, the final Block 2 Starship prototype before SpaceX transitions to the more advanced Block 3 vehicles. Over the past few weeks, it has been inside Mega Bay 2 undergoing a busy final integration campaign. Everything from Raptor engine installation to aft flap fitment, thermal protection system work, final routing of propellant feed lines and hydraulics, and tying together the ship's dense web of avionics. After this extensive round of preparation, Ship 38 rolled out of the Mega Bay early Wednesday morning and headed straight to the launch complex for static fire testing. This rollout gave us a close look at Ship 38's thermal protection system, which is now nearly 100% tiled prior to static fire testing, a change from earlier vehicles that often rolled out with large tile gaps. More importantly, these tiles represent a major design upgrade driven by lessons learned from Flight 10. During Flight 10's re-entry and splashdown, cameras showed scattered white blotches across the ship's heat shield. These marks revealed where plasma had leaked through gaps between tiles and scorched the cow wool ceramic fiber insulation underneath. That insulation layer ultimately held the line and saved the vehicle, but sealing the tile interfaces became a top priority for survivability. SpaceX's solution is what they're calling crunch wrap. Each ceramic tile is wrapped in a thin material before installation, and the excess is trimmed away once the tile is seated. The result is a continuous sealed interface with no fragile gap fillers, one of the major weak points of the shuttle era TPS. With this change, Starship's thermal protection stack now consists of four layers, a pyron ablative coating on the stainless steel skin, a Kaowool insulation blanket, the new crunch wrap interface, and the ceramic tiles themselves. SpaceX quietly tested this concept on Flight 10 in a small patch near the ship's upper section, and those tiles returned intact, while most of the surrounding tiles showed white blotches. With that successful data point, SpaceX has applied the crunch wrap treatment to nearly the entire surface of Ship 38. The forward flaps are the only exception, with no crunch wrap installed behind their TPS tiles. These flaps were redesigned for the Block 2 Starship, made slightly smaller and positioned farther forward and more leeward compared to Block 1. Flight 10 marked their first re-entry test, and the resulting data likely indicated lower heating loads on these new flaps, making the extra sealing layer unnecessary. Flying them without crunch wrap allows SpaceX to verify whether the standard tile installation alone is sufficient, or if additional sealing will still be required on future flights. Flight 11 will serve as the first full trial of the system, exposing it to a broad range of heating rates, shear forces, and plasma gradients across the windward side. When Ship 38 reached the launch site, it was greeted by a heavily modified orbital launch mount. After Ship 36's explosion damaged the Massey site back in June, SpaceX repurposed the OLM itself for ship static fires. As with Ship 37 before Flight 10, a custom test stand, Essentially, a reinforced transport stand was bolted to the OLM using adapter plates in place of the booster hold-down clamps. The booster quick disconnect hood was also modified, with new plumbing routed to a fixed ship QD plate mounted on the hood. Unlike the booster's fully automated quick disconnect, this modified setup required technicians to manually align and secure the ship's QD, fastening it to the pre-installed flanges on the vehicle side and connecting the propellant, electrical, and data lines before testing. Ship 38's first static fire attempt took place Thursday afternoon. The countdown proceeded normally, as ground systems chilled pumps, valves, and propellant lines to cryogenic temperatures. But as propellant loading began, engineers detected irregular behavior in the ship quick disconnect system mounted on the BQD hood. SpaceX immediately aborted the test and placed the vehicle in a safe configuration. Overnight, technicians disconnected the cryogenic hoses, removed the SQD plate for inspection and repairs, then reinstalled and reconnected the system. By Friday morning, the SQD was back online, enabling a second attempt. This time, liquid oxygen was loaded past half-tank capacity before another abort was triggered. This strongly suggests that the ground-side propellant transfer issue was resolved, and the problem was now on the vehicle side. Likely causes include tank pressurization instability, sensor faults, or an automatic cutoff triggered by off-nominal thermal or structural data, common failure points during late-stage cryogenic loading when pressures and thermal gradients are at their peak. 
SpaceX has now scheduled the next static fire attempt for Monday, signaling that deeper troubleshooting and hardware checks are needed before proceeding. The extra time is a cautious but necessary step. A failed ignition or pressurization event could damage flight hardware and delay the program. Ensuring every system is healthy maximizes the chance of a clean static fire and a meaningful test result. After that, Ship 38 will return to the production site for data review, engine inspections, and final flight readiness checks. Booster 15, Ship 38's flight partner, having completed its long-duration static fire days ago, is currently staged inside Mega Bay 1, awaiting final hardware installation. The remaining tasks for the booster include installing the hot stage ring, integrating the flight termination system, and completing final pre-flight checkouts. Once Ship 38's testing is complete, SpaceX will remove the temporary static fire stand from the OLM, reinstall the booster hold-down clamps, and restore the booster quick disconnect system to its standard configuration. If this turnaround proceeds as quickly as Flight 10's, Flight 11 could be ready to launch by early October, pending regulatory approval as well as airspace and maritime clearances. The FAA has released a draft environmental assessment detailing SpaceX's request to update its license for additional Starship launch and re-entry trajectories from Starbase. The report includes a notional map of Starship's return-to-launch site re-entry and landing corridor, the planned path for future tower catch attempts at Starbase. To minimize risk to the public, the proposed trajectories avoid overflights of major U.S. cities. The flight path shows Starship would begin re-entry over the Pacific Ocean, cross California, fly over central Mexico, then pass over Texas before returning to Starbase for landing. Achieving this re-entry corridor requires launching Starship into an orbit with a precisely targeted inclination. So far, all test flights have launched eastward between South Florida and Cuba. Under the new plan, Starship would either fly southeast between Mexico and Cuba or take a northeasterly path over Florida before reaching the Atlantic. Both options cross land, but deliberately avoid major population centers. Each launch and landing would trigger temporary airspace closures, potentially delaying or rerouting 7 to 400 commercial flights per attempt. The FAA determined that these new trajectories would have no significant environmental impacts. Other considerations, such as public safety, national security, foreign policy, and insurance requirements, remain under review. If approved, the first orbital return and tower catch attempt could take place as early as Flight 13. In parallel with Starbase operations, SpaceX is building infrastructure for Starship's future Florida launches. Elon Musk recently confirmed that a new autonomous drone ship named You'll Thank Me Later is under construction, purpose-built to ferry Starship and Super Heavy hardware from Starbase to Cape Canaveral. The vessel is roughly 300 feet long and 100 feet wide. According to Kiko Donchev, SpaceX's VP of launch, the initial trips to the Cape will carry a single booster or ship per trip, but future missions will transport multiple vehicles. If transported horizontally, the drone ship can carry one ship and one booster at a time. If SpaceX secures them vertically with fixtures, similar to Falcon 9's Octagrabber system, the same vessel could transport up to 12 Starship stages or boosters in a single trip. More details on the drone ship including its readiness timeline and how vehicles will be configured for transport, will be shared as work progresses. Meanwhile, SpaceX's LC-39A Starship pad continues to take shape. The flame trench work is progressing, with the massive diverter beam, the backbone of the water-cooled flame deflector, installed several days ago. The diverter buckets, already staged outside the horizontal integration facility, will follow soon. Over the past week, all four legs of the launch mount were erected surrounding the flame trench. The mount structure itself is being assembled at Roberts Road, and its installation will be one of the next major steps. At the current pace, SpaceX could have LC-39A ready for its first Starship launch by late 2026. Back at Starbase, Pad B is approaching operational readiness. Recent tests have focused on the booster liquid oxygen quick disconnect mechanism, which has been repeatedly extended and retracted to verify mechanical alignment and speed control. Methane QD testing is expected to follow soon, and once they are confirmed to be operating as designed, technicians will finish the hood paneling on both BQDs. The gantry structure, which houses propellant lines, electrical conduits, valves, pressurization systems, and other support hardware for the pad operations, is also nearing completion. Teams are sealing each section with protective panels after inspecting and verifying that everything underneath is properly installed, connected, and ready for operations.
the Flame Diverter's water deluge system was activated for the first time last Monday afternoon. This initial test, conducted at a very low flow rate and pressure, confirmed that all major components, including the water tanks, pressurization system, and pad plumbing, are properly installed and functioning, with no leaks or blockages. More powerful tests were conducted on Thursday and Friday, releasing a substantially larger volume of water at higher pressure and velocity to thoroughly flood the flame trench. Each run lasted about 50 seconds, enough to verify water distribution, valve and pump performance, manifold operation, and the trench's structural response under sustained high-pressure conditions. Over the coming days, SpaceX is expected to incrementally increase pressure, flow rate, and test duration, culminating in a full-capacity run to validate the entire deluge system. Meanwhile, additional deluge tanks are being installed in parallel, with two new tanks recently added, bringing the total to 11 and significantly increasing storage capacity. Meanwhile, all scaffolding around the tower's chopstick arms has been removed, signaling that most upgrades are complete. The arms have already been tested extensively for motion range and load capacity, and SpaceX has made several tweaks based on those tests. The final major component still missing is the ship quick disconnect arm, which is expected to roll out soon for installation. If work continues at this pace, Pad B could be fully operational by the end of the year, ready to support the first Block 3 Starship launches, starting with Flight 12. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. NASA has successfully restored contact with the Tracer spacecraft after several weeks of communications blackout, marking a crucial milestone for this newly launched heliophysics mission. Tracers, or the Tandem Reconnection and Cusp Electrodynamics Reconnaissance Satellites, is a NASA-led mission launched on July 23rd atop a Falcon 9 rocket. Its goal is to study magnetic reconnection, a process that occurs when the interplanetary magnetic field carried by the solar wind collides with Earth's magnetosphere. When oppositely directed magnetic field lines meet, they can break and reconnect explosively, releasing massive amounts of energy. This energy accelerates charged particles along Earth's field lines into the magnetospheric cusps, funnel-shaped regions near the poles where solar wind enters the atmosphere, driving auroras and occasionally threatening satellites and power grids. Tracers consists of two identical satellites, SV-1 and SV-2, flying in a 600-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit and separated by 75 to 900 kilometers. This formation allows them to observe the same cusp region at slightly different times, distinguishing spatial variations from temporal ones and providing a near-continuous view of reconnection events. Following a flawless launch, deployment, and initial checkout, NASA engineers began commissioning the spacecraft. Almost immediately, they noticed erratic communications from SV-1, which soon escalated into a complete loss of contact, while SV-2 continued to operate nominally. Preliminary investigations revealed a power subsystem issue worsened by SV-1's incorrect orientation. This misalignment reduced sunlight on its solar arrays, severely restricting power generation and allowing the satellite to function only during short periods of illumination. In response, NASA quickly assembled an anomaly resolution team, pieced together telemetry from those fleeting contacts, modeled SV-1's orbit and attitude, and began sending reset and recovery commands during every available window. After nearly two months of persistent effort, their patience paid off. On September 11th, SV-1 finally responded, confirming it was still alive. Controllers immediately placed the satellite in safe mode, ran exhaustive diagnostics, and verified its systems and instruments before resuming commissioning. The next step is to synchronize SV-1 with SV-2 and begin joint science operations later this month. Each tracer satellite carries six instruments designed to collect thousands of measurements during repeated cusp passes throughout the 12-month mission. This tandem configuration offers a continuous step-by-step -step view of magnetic reconnection, unlike earlier missions limited to brief snapshots. These observations will help scientists build more accurate space weather models, improve our understanding of solar terrestrial interactions, and better protect modern technology from geomagnetic disruptions. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.